My name is Jeff Stone, and I am the chair of AJC's Asia Pacific Institute. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to this morning's AJC University session. Let me start with a few words about AJC's Asia Pacific Institute, which we refer to as API. Under the direction of our leader, Shira Lohenberg, who's sitting here in the room, API has an, has an aggressive and important mission. We seek to raise awareness about the Jewish people and Israel. We advocate on issues of Jewish concern. We make connections. And we build strong relations with political, business, and opinion leaders throughout the Asia Pacific region and their representatives in the United States. Through AJC's 22 regional offices across the United States, API also forges partnerships with the growing and increasingly important Asian American population. More information about API can be found on the brochures on your table, and I hope today's session will give you an idea of why API is such a unique and important institute for a global advocacy organization like AJC. We're here this morning to talk about one country that is of particular importance to us, and that is China. Now, we have all heard of America's foreign policy pivot to Asia, and a large part of this pivot or reorientation stems from the spectacular growth of China, whose economic success and increasingly assertive international posture is bringing shifts in the balance of power regionally and globally. American involvement in this area, traditionally focused on our historic ties with Japan and South Korea and smaller nations to the south, may need to be reevaluated in light of China's rise. Additionally, as part of the P5 plus one group of nations currently attempting to negotiate a deal with Iran to limit its nuclear program, China is playing an increasingly important role in strategic international affairs. Its growing assertiveness on the international stage, its economic power, its interest in taking a more prominent role may have, indeed does have, serious implications for events in the Middle East and the security of Israel. Clearly, China's future and its trajectory toward that future should concern all of us. And to help us understand what the rise of China means for this emerging and reordering world order, we have with us today a man who knows the subject not only from years of study and analysis, but from deep personal experience over many years in China. Our guest this, after, this morning, John Huntsman, is the former U.S. Ambassador to China and also former Governor of Utah, which gives him a unique perspective in American foreign policy to understand the relationship between foreign policy and domestic politics. Governor Huntsman will be inter interviewed by Jamie Metzl, a member of API's advisory board and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gover Governor Huntsman and Jamie Metzl. Capacity, diplomatic capacity, with military capacity, uh, and 
every issue uh, that we will explore, China will play an important role. But in many ways, China is also not prepared for that uh, responsibility. And China, uh, I think as an ambassador huntsman, I imagine will say, you see both sides. You see China playing a more responsible international role and China gaming the international system for its own, uh, for its own benefit. And so this complex relationship of collaboration and competition, and sometimes uh, relations even worse than competition, uh, are going to be part of every issue that we, uh, that we explore, every experience that we as a country uh, have over the, over the coming century. Uh, I'm delighted, and we're delighted to have uh, Governor Huntsman uh, with us. Uh, Governor Huntsman, as Jeff said, uh, has a deep relationship with uh, China, uh, but that relationship is about much more uh, than just his uh, time being ambassador. He was a, an absolutely fantastic ambassador. And so uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different, uh, difficult and challenging issues uh, today related to China. Uh, but at its core, uh, the U.S.-China relationship uh, is about a relationship of human beings. And so I thought it might be nice uh, to start with your personal experience, coming back to your, your early days and your family days, you talk about your Excuse personal me. relationship. Uh, I think you need microphones, don't you? We have uh, them. You don't have to use them. That's very loud. Oh, if you, you need to turn it on. Was it? I think you need to turn the on switch there. Does everybody hear that? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Really? <laughs> anyway, if you didn't hear something from the introduction, you can talk to any of the people in the front row. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for letting us know. Governor Hudson. Jamie, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, one of the more brilliant people I've ever had a chance to interact with, and we're delighted to have you associated with the Atlantic Council, where, where I serve as board chair. Uh, you know, they say when you talk about sensitive subjects like China, uh, as a diplomat, you're supposed to say something when there's nothing to say, and nothing when there's something to say. You're always somehow caught between a cliche and an indiscretion. I'm going to try to break loose from that since I'm retired from public service. But I have to tell you, just on the personal front, uh, and I'll be moving back to Asia in two weeks. Uh, our family spends the summers in Asia. I've, I've lived in Asia four times during my career over the last 35 years, twice in Taiwan, once in Singapore, the diplomatic corps, and then in China. Uh, and it provides us an opportunity to reconnect every summer because the region, as you know, is moving so quickly. And without being on the ground, breathing the air, talking to leaders, getting a sense of the economic and political trends, we lose uh, any ability to track what's happening very, very quickly, particularly in this town where conventional wisdom seems to prevail more often than not, or <laughs> there is a local sense of conventional wisdom. So the personal connection that you're probably referring to is the little person from China who lives in our home. So we have uh, an adopted daughter, in fact two adopted daughters, one from China, one from India, both of whom were abandoned. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, little Grace, she was abandoned at, uh, at two months of age, left behind in a vegetable market in the city of Yangzhou, uh, where she was picked up by the police, sent to the local orphanage, and we were connected with her. <laughs> you doing good to see you. And we were connected uh, about six months later. And now she's 16 years old, just getting her driver's license, wondering where she's gonna go to college, studying Chinese language, where we talk over the dinner table in Chinese, just to make sure that she's keeping up with things. Uh, and she's a, she's a daily reminder, as my wife likes to tell me, that although 10,000 miles might separate us, this vast Pacific Ocean, that all hearts beat alike. Uh, and every time I have to deal with China on sensitive issues, I'm reminded of that. That fundamentally, people on both sides of the great divide called the Pacific Ocean want the same outcome. They want safe neighborhoods, they want security, they want stability, they want prosperous economies, they want opportunities for the next generation. It's the political challenges that get in the way in terms of how we define the individual in society, how we go about problem solving uh, around issues tied to our own uh, national interests that seem to get a little complicated, and more so over time. Yeah. And then those issues get very complicated because there, as you mentioned, there's just different drivers of different societies 
and then based on often a set of domestic priorities, there are a bunch of international actions, and then there are reactions, and pretty soon we are in a situation like we have today, where there, we are in an escalatory environment between the United States and, and China, and there are real fears that there could be even shooting at some point, in, perhaps in the, in the South China Sea, which is something that I think nobody, uh, nobody wants. But because on both sides, domestic drivers are, are very important, I thought we might begin our conversation talking about some of those domestic drivers uh, in, uh, in China. As I think many observers uh, believe, and certainly uh, what I believe, um, one of the big uh, drivers of China's uh, behavior domestically and internationally uh, is the desire uh, to keep the party in this central role, the driving role uh, within, uh, within China. And oftentimes that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of tension um, so let's, we can talk about that in terms of, uh, of economic activity, and we can also talk about it uh, in terms of political activity and, and the party wanting to position itself as the champion of, um, of Chinese nationalism. But right now, there's a big reform pu uh, push in, uh, in China, both for economic reform and uh, the anti-corruption uh, campaign. Can you talk a little bit about the internal reform program and how, if at all, that conflicts, uh, if it does, uh, with the party's desire to stay in the, the driving uh, position within Chinese society. Right. So let, let's look at just a moment at what the party is, yes. because it is central to all organizing and decision making mm -hmm. in China. So here you have China, the Middle Kingdom, uh, 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 1.3, going on 1.4 billion people. Uh, the largest standing army in the world, uh, largest emitter of CO2 greenhouse gas, the second largest economy. The party is central to leadership, decision making, and the way forward. Uh, the political rhythm of China, much like we have elections, they have party congresses that uh, they convene every five years and have since the death of Mao Zedong in 1976. Leadership decisions are made based on that rhythm, uh, and five-year plans are basically uh, a launch based upon that rhythm as well. So what is the party today? The party founded in 1921. Uh, today is about 80 million people. Uh, if you want to get ahead in life, whether in government or a state-owned enterprise or your local municipality, you better sign on with the party because you'll have more of a direct shot to leadership ultimately. 80 million people scattered amongst 3,500 outposts, party outposts around the country. The problem today is this. The party is not transparent. It hasn't delivered on uh, the key desires of the people. Uh, it is corrupt to the core. Uh, and the citizenry in China have basically had enough. Uh, and since there is no alternative governing system, only one party, uh, the new leader, Xi Jinping, who will be 62 years old in a week, uh, his efforts on the economic reform, Jamie, that you mentioned, and the political reform around the anti-corruption campaign is premised on one outcome, and that is he must save and rehabilitate the party. Because if the party collapses, there's no alternative governing structure, uh, and therefore you have a cataclysmic set of events that will play out throughout the, the Asia-Pacific region. So he is proceeding on two fronts now that he's been in office for two years. Uh, he'll be re-upped at the 19th Party Congress, which will take place in 2017. He'll then serve that final term until the 20th Party Congress in 2022. So this is a man, Xi Jinping, soon 62 years old, son of Xi Jinping, who we should all get to know because he's going to be around a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's uh, an aggressive, assertive, confident leader, unlike the guy they had for the last 10 years, Hu Jintao, who was kind of a party consensus builder. He wasn't a leader. He didn't have much of a vision. I would argue they had a wasted decade for the last 10 years before she took the stage. She now takes the stage with the idea that China isn't an emerging power. In his head, it's simply returning to the global status quo, where China's been the largest economy in the world for 18 of the last 20 centuries. Uh, it fell victim to uh, uh, some lethargy, corruption, and internal demise uh, along about the middle of the Qing Dynasty, and of course it hasn't recovered until now. Invasions, incursions, revolutions, upheavals in the intervening years. And so in Xi's head, they're simply returning to where they were, you know, uh, along about the, the Jacksonian period of American history. Uh, two things have to happen if he's going to make this party rehabilitation work. 
And even then, there's no guarantee that it's uh, going to have any kind of long-term effect. Number one, he has to build trust in how the people of China see the party. Because right now, there is a trust deficit, a trust gap, much like the trust deficit we have in this country. People don't trust their institutions of governance anymore. Uh, you look at the numbers around Congress, and you know they're single digits, for heaven's sake. China's having the same problem. And it's interesting, because I always do the taxi cab test when I'm in China. I'll jump in different taxi cabs in Shanghai or Beijing. Uh, I was there on the board of Ford Motor Company just last month. And around where they're launching the Mustang at the 50, 50th anniversary of the Mustang automobile. We just launched it in China. Uh, and you jump in a cab and you have conversations with the Lao Bai Xing, with the uh, average people. And it's very interesting because you'll get, a, pick, you'll get you know, a sense of how they feel about the party, how they feel about Xi Jinping, how they feel about their, their own circumstances. And my very unscientific approach to the public surveys would yield this. People don't like the party. Uh, they don't trust the party. But they like Xi Jinping because they feel that he is on their side. Uh, he is getting rid of the dead wood, uh, the rot at the center of the party that is probably responsible for the most egregious cases of corruption. Uh, and he's trying to reform and globalize the economy. So why is he trying to globalize the economy? Uh, he's trying to globalize the economy because they've really run to the end of their export model. They've reached the middle income trap, and for real wages to get any higher than they are and to expand opportunity, commerce, and industry, uh, they're going to have to break down the investment-led export model, which they've relied on for 30, 35 years, which has yielded them enormous returns, by the way. And they're going to have to move more toward a consumption model, where they have more people buying, participating in the economy, and ultimately taking out their very high savings rate, 30 35% just the opposite of what we have in this country, and investing it in the long-term well-being of China, which is a hard argument for Xi Jinping to make, because most people who are citizens of China remember that every 20 years or so there's a major upheaval that causes people to flee, run for cover, or hide their renminbi under the mattress, which is where a lot of people have their renminbi. Uh, and then, so that's on the economic side, and we can talk about some of the individual economic reform measures that are being anticipated and indeed launched. Uh, and then on the political side, he's making the argument that I've got to build trust. The only way to build trust is to take down, as he calls it, the tigers and the flies. So the tigers, the laohus, are the big hitters in China that he's going after. The flies are just the ordinary party functionaries who he's rounding up by the hundreds. Uh, I've gotten to know two consecutive uh, mayors of Nanjing over the last two years, both of whom have disappeared recently. They've rounded up, disappeared. Uh, Anti-corruption charges. So I see it playing out at the local levels, but at the highest levels, he's also gone after people like Zhou Yongkang, who, while I was in China serving as ambassador, was the most powerful man in the country. It wasn't Hu Jintao, the president. It was a man who had the ninth seat on the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, who was responsible for security. That was Zhou Yongkang. He had the dirt on everybody, and he was absolutely untouchable. Furthermore, there was little history to suggest that any sitting member of the standing committee or retired member of the standing committee could ever be rounded up. It was just sort of beyond people's ability to, to do that. Uh, you have to go all the way back to 1979. The last member of the standing committee to be rounded up and imprisoned was uh, one of the members of the Gang of Four uh, before the, uh, the rise of Deng Xiaoping. So, Zhou Yongkang now uh, in Tianjin, uh, under house arrest, waiting, uh, waiting trial. Uh, second, you have one of the more respected uh, military leaders, uh, General Xu Tsai Ho, who was number two in the Central Military Commission, who has also been uh, rounded up uh, on charges of selling rank. <clears throat> so you want to get an extra star on your shoulder in the People's Liberation Army, it'll cost you a little bit of money. Uh, it doesn't work the same way that things do here. You pay a little bit, and you'll get a higher rank, and that's exactly what he's been charged with. So he's been taken out. Uh, you look at people like Ling Jihua, who was uh, a political functionary, kind of a chief of staff to Hu Jintao uh, recently. And then last month, uh, they took out a guy named uh, Wang Tianhu, who was president of a company called Sinopec, which is their uh, oil and gas conglomerate from a market capitalization standpoint, I'd have to say it's probably the biggest company in the world these days, Mark, uh, valued at probably $500 billion. Well, their president was just taken out. 
uh, and it's uh, so the tigers are going and the flies are going and, and Xi Jinping is doing his thing trying to prove the point <clears throat> that he's not going to accept uh, this kind of corruption in the party uh, and we'll see how long he can how far he can take that and yes I mean I it's certainly the anti-corruption campaign has touched many many people uh, my friend uh, in China was kind of the the Lou Dobbs of China, a guy named Tri uh, Rengang, uh, who everybody in China would know. He was at every single night on CCTV, he had the lead uh, news program, and he was Good connected to Zhou Yongkang yeah. and now vanished. Uh, so certainly this anti-corruption campaign is touching a lot of, of people, but you talked about the role of, of the party, and this is what I see as the paradox of the anti-corruption campaign and the reform effort. The party, as, as certainly as she uh, uh, believes, and as you've articulated, <laughs> is part of the solution of cleaning up things in China because they are the center of power. And yet the party, paradoxically, uh, is also the core problem that China faces because uh, the, how do you get legitimacy, how do you get power within this kind of structure? And you do it by sharing goodies in the pyramid so people <laughs> below you. And so the, the, the party is, the, is it, corruption is not a cancer on the Communist Party of China. Corruption is the essence of the, of the Communist Party of China. So how do you clean up something uh, when the problem that you're cleaning up is you yourself? And even with China's uh, talk about rule of law, and they had a, 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 a plenary last year uh, talking about rule of law, it was the rule of law with the party above the rule of law. And I know that you've spoken a lot of, uh, about this. I think this is this, this very complicated um, uh, situation with reform, and I think that, in, in my mind, is, uh, that economic reform is the highest priority, and then this anti-corruption is a way of, I think as you, you've suggested, kind of pushing people in, in the right direction to get that done. But as that happened, uh, we're also seeing this increase of Chinese aggressiveness, and a legitimate, maybe even a greater legitimation of Chinese nationalism. And we're seeing it certainly in the East China Sea. Uh, relations with Japan have now gotten a little bit better over, over recent months, but they're really terrible. In the South China Sea, the so-called <coughs> Nine Dash Line, uh, where China is very aggressively asserting territorial claims uh, at the expense uh, of, um, of Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, and many other partners of, uh, of, of, of the United States. Um, do you think that there's a shift that's going? How do you, how do you account for this rise of, of this increase in levels of nationalism, and uh, what do you see as the root cause? Is it more strategic? Is it domestic political? What do you, what do you see as the mix of drivers towards China's uh, recent assertiveness? I think there are a couple of things at play. One one of them would clearly be uh, necessary politics for Xi Jinping. He has to play to certain audiences. And it's interesting because we look at the United States and the complex, uh, the layers of, of politics that go on behind decisions. And we sometimes think of Chinese as being a rather homogeneous political entity. Well, I'll never forget when a guy named Wang Qishan, who now is one of the seniors within the Standing Committee of the Politburo, the guy responsible for the anti-corruption campaign drive, uh, came up to me after one round of negotiations and he said, Da Shi Shenzhen, Mr. Ambassador, woman Zhongguo, ye you Zhengzhi. We also have politics in China, mm -hmm. as if to say, you crazy Americans, you only think that your system is complicated. Our system is real complicated yeah. too, and we have politics behind the scenes that you sometimes don't understand within the party. So the biggest difference now in Chinese politics than in years uh, before is the rise of special interest groups within Chinese politics. Pretty soon they're going to look like the United States, for heaven's sake. They didn't have this before, but now you've got the financial sector, you've got, you've got the oil folks, uh, you've got the extraction industries, you've got the energy sector, and they're all now playing a role in politics like, ne like never before. So how do you send the messages you need to send to the various factions that matter in, uh, the, politi in the Chinese political constellation? Well, she has his hands on the uh, levers of, of the economy, so he can do a few things on the economy to, to stimulate growth and make the people feel pretty good. But he's got another one called nationalism uh, that is a big winner in China, particularly when you run all the newspapers and you can basically put whatever headline or spin on the story you want. Uh, and nationalism is a big one. So we saw right after Xi's rise to power in 2012, uh, and the rise of a man named Shinzo Abe, who is the prime minister of uh, Japan, now in for his second time, the grandson of Nobusuke Kishi, by the way, who ran Japan-administered Manchukuo 
during, uh, during the 30s and the 40s. So already you can sense the generational tension and the familial <clears throat> uh, discontent that exists between Xi's family, again the son of Xi Jinping, who was a deputy prime minister under Mao, and Shinzo Abe's family in Tokyo. So you'd look at the island dispute and you'd say it's another island dispute between you know China, Japan, and uh, the Senkaku and Diaoyu Islands. But deeper you find, geez, these families have really been at each other for a long time. And there's an interesting story to be told there that really hasn't been uh, articulated well. So you've got the East China Sea Islands, uh, and I, I would argue that she went aggressively after those when he was put in power to help consolidate his power, uh, his power base. So he had to win over the People's Liberation Army. You got to get the generals and the admirals within the Central Military Commission. What better way than to take a hard line against the Senkaku Diaoyu Island? He did that for two years. Now it's calmed down. And people would say, gee, you know, Huntsman, do you think they're going to go to war with this? Is it not going to go to war? We've, I've seen this cycle play out time and time again. It's, it's a very easy way of a, leader's, uh, of, uh, of a leader's ability to consolidate power when they need to. You just take on Japan over the islands. But this was deeper because of the familial relationships. So then you go to the South China Sea, which is, I, I think is infinitely more complicated than the East China Sea problem, because that's a bilateral dispute for the most part. Korea has some claim against Japan, not against China, uh, but it's not nearly as complex as the, uh, as the Paracels and the Spratly Islands, among other reefs that are part of this vast body of water called the South China Sea. So when you talk about China uh, having claim to, to 3 million square miles of water, well, if you do the math, uh, in their head, that's the East China Sea, the Yellow Sea, and the whole South China Sea. There's no other way you can get 3 million mm -hmm. square nautical miles out of that one. So historically, they would pull out the old maps from the Qing Dynasty, which ended, of course, in 1911, mm -hmm. with the rise of the Republic of China under Sun Yat-sen. And they say, here's our land. Mm -hmm. And it includes, by the way, Taiwan, uh, uh, Macau, uh, Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, and the whole East China Sea and South China Sea Islands. This is a, and it's going to be our job, from a foreign policy and national security standpoint, to get all of it back. So if you want to say, what's What's in the head of the policy planners uh, in Zhongnanhai, in the White House in Beijing? It is recovering the lost territories. Now, how do they define the lost territories? They all go back to the Qing Dynasty. Those are the lost territories. So they have Hong Kong as of 97. They have Macau as of 99. They have Tibet. They have Xinjiang. They have Inner Mongolia. They don't have Taiwan. Although I was there two weeks ago leading a security delegation, met with President Ma and met with the president to be, Tsai Ing wen, who will uh, be elected in, in January, which is an interesting story all by itself. And that's going to present a really interesting dynamic uh, in terms of the cross strait relationship between China and Taiwan, which has really settled down in recent years mm -hmm. thanks to increased trade and confidence building and all that. It's about to flare up again. Yeah. It's about to flare up again, is a, is a major uh, issue. But the South China Sea is a, a tough one, and I think Deng Xiaoping, who ran the country right after Mao Zedong, uh, got it about right. He said, we're not going to figure out a solution to these islands. Let's let the next generation decide. Yeah. These are about sovereignty, and there's no way to solve issues around sovereignty. Let them begin resource sharing. That yeah. was kind of And yet she has gone against that and said, well, we don't have generations to deal with these problems. So I think she very consciously has, has turned up the heat in, mm -hmm. in, in some of these disputes. And I think they hide your strength and bide your time. Yeah, that's what they Dumb used to say. Things. Now they say just show your strength. Now and you've see got what your you strength, do. and yeah. you can kind of do what you want to do. But and yet, and yet, it may be premature. We, we, we will uh, we'll see. Uh, so yes, there are these these historical claims that that China has. I think China, at some level, deep in their subconscious, perhaps recognizes that some of them are a bit preposterous, uh, which is why uh, China is so angry the Philippines is taking China to the, the tribunal of the, uh, the International Tribunal for the, the Law of the Sea, uh, which is why China doesn't want to arbitrate uh, in many of these, uh, these conflicts uh, in the international arena, it only wants to have bilateral uh, relations. But, uh, so part of this, it seems to me, uh, is about historical claims. But these historical claims come and go, and China has a very a convenient way of getting conquered by somebody and then declaring your conqueror a dynasty. So you get conquered by the, conquered by the Mongols and you'd say, oh, now it's the Yuan dynasty, you're conquered by and the Manchurians. And here's how complicated the, yeah. it can get to that point, you know, just being reminded of this yeah. thing in, in Taiwan, meeting yeah. with the head of the KMT, the head of the Guomindang, yeah. right. Chiang Kai-shek's old party, 
Uh, we supported the Gwomindong's claim yes, to the Nine Dash Island geography, but it wasn't Nine Dash, it was Eleven Dash right. back in those days. It was even more sweeping in terms of right. the islands that it took in. And so you sit down with uh, the leaders in China and they say, well, what gives? Right. You supported this construct right. under Chiang Kai-shek in 1947. What caused you to change all this? So it becomes the war of words and the war of maps and the different interpretations yes. of history. And that's why I think fundamentally we're, we're going to have to come up with a new construct, a new way of seeing the South China Sea, not just the United States, but in collaboration with the seafaring nations of the world, the leading seafaring nations of the world. But, but do you think, though, in these claims and in the aggressiveness, especially, especially recently, that China has been um, prosecuting these claims, uh, that there's an element that they're testing us. That when they push Japan, <clears throat> in many ways, they're pushing us. They're testing how far they can push Japan without eliciting an alliance response from us. Uh, with the Mischief Reef or the Thomas Shoal or all mm. these other areas, mm. uh, again, another treaty ally of the United States, uh, where China is pushing with this salami slice strategy just a little bit at a, at a time, a push not so great that it elicits an alliance response, great enough that it starts to give the message that you can't really rely on, on the United States. I mean, do you think that there's, in there's, these conflicts they're, they're no testing us? About that. They're trying to uh, invalidate us in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. They're trying to prove that we're a paper tiger uh, and that ultimately they, we can be pushed out. Uh, and it means that we need to recognize that right up front yeah. and, and ensure that we do what we've always done in the Asia Pacific region, which is to put protection of the global commons as a core objective. I mean, that. As the Chinese say, our core uh, issues are Taiwan and Tibet and Xinjiang and the islands. We have core issues too, we don't talk about those. And uh, the, the protection of the global commons, if that is the core issue for the United States, I don't know what would be. Yeah. Uh, but this is clearly what they're doing. They want to test our resolve. They want to test the resolve of uh, the Seventh Fleet in our response. Mm -hmm. They want to test the resolve of Pentagon policymakers. Right. So you set up an ADIZ around, uh, around the East China Sea and say, what will the Americans do? You know, right. We'll throw this out there and see what the Americans do. We fly a B-52 through and mm -hmm. you know, show them that it's, it's not valid or legitimate. They'll probably consider putting up an ADIZ around South China Sea as well, and we'll have to figure out what to do there. So again, I get back to, what do we do about this? Because so, these issues of sovereignty yes. are really <laughs> difficult, and there, no one is ever, no one is ever uh, uh, right uh, or wrong as you argue these things. We're going to have to assemble not just the claimants, which would include Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, uh, and Vietnam. And remember, China and Vietnam have fought, have shot bullets at each other uh, uh, over this issue uh, in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and of course, they ran a Philippine destroyer aground over yes. Scarborough uh, not so long ago. So uh, this has this already been a fairly tense issue with some of the claimants. But we should be corralling not only the claimants who don't want to deal with China on a bilateral basis because they get eaten alive. They want to deal with it in a from a multilateral context. And so ASEAN, as a grouping of 10 nation states in Southeast Asia, has a role to play. But I would argue as well, the seafaring nations of the world all have a role to play. Because if you stop to think that over half of all global trade flows through the South China Sea, this is a huge deal for every seafaring nation of the world. Uh, and we should be, uh, along with the UK and some of our traditional partners, assembling a coalition that really take this seriously. Yeah. But I also think we need a common framework of reference, like the law of the seas at some point. We're going to have to have something that represents a template for the rules of the road. Right. That will guide us going forward. And then longer term, we're going to have to say every one of the claimants deserves some geography. How will that be divided mathematically? and how will it be used in terms of resource extraction, military exercises, and the one issue that we never get that is so important to the people in Asia, fishing. Mm. So as they've told me, we're not going to go to war over oil, but we might go to war over tuna fishing. Mm. You know, that for us is a really important issue. So there are, there are a lot, lots of equities at play here, and, and I'm convinced that the current way we're looking at it where you say, we'll just send in another carrier battle group in the flexor. That's, I think, a road to nowhere. Uh, you know, our, our strength needs to be tied to a strategy that has a logical play out from today to the very end. And step by step, we should take it, along with like-minded countries, and have the military that plays an appropriate role in terms of projecting power at the right moments. But sending in a carrier battle group just to send in a carrier battle group, you know, it's, it's playing a chess game without fundamentally understanding your last move on the table and finding yourself boxed real fast. And I think that is the essential point, what you just made. I think that, that is just 
I think it's perhaps your frustration, it's my frustration with, with what the United States is doing. China has its own politics, as, as you say, but they can be very strategic, very long-term players. In the United States, uh, we've got every advantage, we've, uh, but we're, we're playing down our hand very quickly. And I think exactly what you're saying is we, we aren't thinking of this relationship systematically, strategically, and long-term. And so uh, we, with a much better hand, we're increasingly losing the game. Uh, and that's, I think you're, you're exactly right. Uh, one of the things, I mean, you talked about uh, the U.S. as the champion of an international system uh, that we helped to create, that we led the creation of. And yet something like the law of the sea, where we are about uh, to send warships into the South China Sea uh, to enforce the law of the sea. And yet, ironically, we as a country haven't ratified it. And so I mean, you've uh, done such great work as in, both in foreign policy and in, uh, in domestic policy. Uh, but, and uh, you probably share many of our frustrations that, that the core element of U.S. power is our domestic strength. And it sometimes feels um, that we haven't woken up, we haven't had our, our Sputnik moment uh, with, uh, with China, and not a Sputnik moment that says we need to enforce our military capabilities, although very likely we do, but our Sputnik moment that tells us that we really have a competitor. And there's a competitor who maybe even has a different view of the role of the state and the role of the individual, a different view of how different countries should relate to one another. And for us to be in as strong a position as possible, we need to get our act uh, together at, at home. Do you, do you feel that, Ed, that on, a, on a macro level here in the United States, people are internalizing the lesson of China? I think they're confused by China because of the way China's reported for the, for mm -hmm. the most part. And that gets back to my bigger gripe about uh, journalists not really understanding the subject matter. I mean, let's face it, we don't have a lot of Harrison Salisbury's left mm -hmm. in journalism today, you know, who used to write about the subject matter better than anybody and right. was as well informed as anybody about the subject matter. Uh, now it's sort of the sound bite and, you know, the drama, whatever you can squeeze out of it. I worry about where that takes us in terms of the opinions uh, that we're developing uh, around around China. But the way that we're seen by the Chinese is uh, uh, as a country that always seems to surprise. Mm -hmm. So they think they've got us figured out, and then uh, Microsoft pops up, changes the world. They think they've got us figured out in Google. Mm -hmm. They think they've got us figured out, and we, we have an energy revolution mm -hmm. which we're now experiencing, where you can create critical building block raw materials as we do in one of our companies in Louisiana and export it to China cheaper mm -hmm. than you can actually make it in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, the dynamic is so changed in terms of uh, manufacturing economics. And every time that happens, I think the Chinese look back and say, America's a surprising, we can't yeah. figure out for the life of us how that political system works. Mm -hmm. And they're probably right about that. Figure out how we can have a party, two party system that doesn't ever get anything done and just hurry and right. And then a whole new industry is created worth mm -hmm. trillions of dollars that will fuel us into the future. This is what they would like. They would like to uh, steal that chapter out of the economic development book on innovation. How is it done? How do you raise a new generation of innovators? How do you create research universities? It's really hard to do that without the internet, without full access to the internet. And that's a big problem they're gonna to have to deal with. It's really hard to do that without uh, a, a fully loaded, blossoming and robust uh, civil society. And they're gonna to have to deal with that part too. Uh, but it's interesting because there are some, there are some tremendously talented entrepreneurs ro roaming the countryside in China. And I used to make it a point when I would travel to a different province or town and I hit about every one of the provinces in China when I was there, to A, <clears throat> meet with people who were in trouble with their government. Because you always learn something interesting about folks who've got the government breathing down their back. Uh, and some of them weren't willing to meet with me, obviously, for obvious reasons, but others were. And you'd always learn something really important. And two, I'd always <clears throat> make it a point to uh, stop at a local university to stop, talk to young kids and get their attitudes about life in the West. And then meet with entrepreneurs where I could. And uh, whether it was in Shanghai or Xiamen, or whether it was in Qinghai, which is like the Wyoming of, mm -hmm. of China, never the Utah of China, but the Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Young, smart, dynamic entrepreneurs who would talk like people in Silicon Valley. They dress like people in Silicon Valley. They think like people in Silicon Valley. And the thought that I would always leave with 
Well, as soon as China gets their regulatory system right and figure out, figures out what to do with respect to rule of law, business adjudication, respect for intellectual property, which we're a long way off on, this place really does have some long-term yeah. potential. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you can't spend time in China without walking away yeah. thinking that very far. Yeah. And it's really unbelievable, and it comes back to the point that we discussed earlier about the role of the party, that China, if just with a few tweaks, I mean, China has been great at, at phase one of its economic development, which the Soviet Union was really great at, at phase one. But it's the transitioning from phase one to phase two, right. which is, is much more They've done more the easy part. Yeah. You, know, you can discount your currency, you can draw on cheap yeah. labor, and use all the uh, raw materials you have domestically, and you can have 30 years of growth. You can yeah. have a great run, and they've had that great run. Yeah. And, and that's then, over. Yeah, and then you can add, and that's over. Yeah, maybe you can add 10 or 20 years to that, which the Soviet Union couldn't do, by just stealing everything you can from everybody else, because yeah. you, you get, I mean, it's, there's a huge, advantage of shifting the R&D from one country, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars from one country to another. But at the end of the day, I was just in, in China last month talking to people, I said that if you are building a company based on stealing IPR from, from somebody else, when you get to the point where you're almost caught up and then you say, all right, now we need to innovate. Well, innovation isn't in the DNA of your company, no matter who, no matter how talented the, right. the people are. And I think that they're, That's right. they're, it's in a way they're taxing the rest of the world with this, this uh, theft of, in, of intellectual you property. You haven't built up the infrastructure yeah. necessary to sustain innovation. Yes. You've and picked the, up the, yeah. the technology here and there, yep. and it's low-hanging fruit, and you've saved a few billion bucks by doing it. But right. you haven't built up that infrastructure that is so important yeah. for long-term sustainable innovation. Yeah. Absolutely. So just one more question, and then we're going to open it up uh, for, for uh, all of you because the, the, all of this we could spend weeks months years and still not get to the bottom of this I mean China is so big and so vast and so complex I always say that no individual no matter how brilliant they are can understand the whole it's only by having lots and lots of conversations with everybody else that we can start to, to, to grapple with it uh, but China uh, like Meiji Japan uh, did uh, in the, the the 19th century has done a phenomenal job of learning from the rest of the world. Say we have some big problem that we need to tackle, what's everybody else doing and what's the best practice? Right. And even uh, I mean, I, the, the theft of intellectual property, it's a kind of a backhanded compliment. I mean, nobody wants to be complimented in that, uh, in that way. But they've recognized that they're behind and they have a lot of catching up to do and they have to learn from, from, uh, from everybody else. My fear, as I mentioned before, is that the United States we don't recognize how much we have to learn from China. So based on your deep knowledge of China, what are the things that the United States could learn from China where they do things uh, in a different way or maybe a better way than we do and that we would be well served by studying them? Well, I think your point is exactly right. And it's rare that a nation state can be reborn as yeah. China was and then reborn again under Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s where a couple of legacy pieces live on that we're all about. And the Deng Dynasty is now over. But what lives on is the fact that he threw the doors open diplomatically and economically, and the fact that he said, and the party will be our, our, our salient feature of governance and, and decision making. And with that, they were able to cherry pick all of the best ideas, whether it was hotel management or high-speed rail or how to run an airport or how to build cars. You can kind of cherry pick all of the best practices out there as you rebuild your nation state. So they have spent 25, 30 years in the classroom of the world, so to speak, getting the very best practices from the best, best out there. Um, in terms of, so the last point is, well, what can we learn from that? So here's what I think. Here's what I think is, is important. So there's this thing called education in China that always used to absolutely amaze me. And so my kids have, have gone to school in, uh, in, in Taiwan, Singapore, China, uh, and two or three states within the United States. I've seen public schools, private schools, home schools, I've seen it all. Mm -hmm. I have two sons in the, you know, been to the military academies, the Naval Academy, got a daughter who went to the Manhattan School of Music. So I've seen specialty schools as well. And I'd have to say that I left China wishing that I could package up their way of educating young people. And moreover, the attitudes that are on display in every family, for the most part, on the importance of education and how core that is to success throughout life. So the teacher, the Lao Shi, uh, so my grandfather was a high school teacher. He retired as the pr uh, principal of Los Altos High School in California. But he, throughout his career, he always used to tell me, his oldest grandson, 
Uh, I'm, I'm not a teacher, I'm an educator, mm -hmm. which is as high as you get in terms mm -hmm. of the pecking order of life. That's how he saw himself. And when I was then elected governor, I put more money behind teachers than any Republican probably in the history of the country. Because uh, uh, I always remember what he'd say about the importance of educators. Well, there's not a child in China who doesn't look up to the Lao Shu, the teacher, with great respect and affection uh, in the classroom, outside the classroom, and that translates into everything that goes on. So you go to school, and you get out of school, as you've seen, Jamie, and you go to a Bushiban. Then you go to another school in the afternoon to do your homework or do your study hall. Yeah. And then you get home and mom and dad are saying, have you done this? Have you done that? You know, time to study more characters, time to study your yeah. instrument. And, uh, and it gives the kids uh, a huge head start. Yeah. <clears throat> Not that their educational system is perfect uh, because they have ways of teaching that are less uh, uh, Socratic than ours, more rote. Um, and, uh, they, they're getting more in the way of higher ed opportunities as they expand their, their complement of higher education opportunities. And then, sadly, they've got a huge, kind of like we do, uh, a big drop-off when you get out of school in terms of employment opportunities. So unemployment among the seven million college graduates each year is pretty darn high and very dispiriting for young people. But they get a, they get a good education. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, we have lots of, of questions. Uh, so why don't we start with you, and maybe if you wait for the microphone. Uh, Cliff Goldstein from Los Angeles. Uh, how, how, Governor, do you see the evolution or the current, current policy as to China's role in the Security Council? Uh, they supported uh, sanctions against Iran. They did not support the U.S. in efforts uh, in Syria. Uh, how has that evolved, and how do you see that evolving going forward, particularly as it relates to the Middle East? Yeah, thanks, Cliff. And I know you'll understand my English because I'm a valley guy, too. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's episodic. It's uh, opportunistic, I hate to say. Uh, on issues around Iran, the United States, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, because I was on the front line in Beijing, working this issue with my best friend, virtually in the diplomatic corps, Amos, who is the Israeli ambassador in China. And uh, uh, we worked very hard in getting sanctions uh, on board with the Chinese who were reluctant to be involved. And then, of course, on, uh, with respect to Assad, they, they peeled away, mostly following Russia's lead. So traditionally, they've got this really interesting uh, I, uh, kind of unwritten rule uh, with Russia, and that is on issues pertaining to the Middle East, particularly Syria, they defer to Russia's input. Uh, on issues concerning North Korea, the Russians then defer to Beijing, and it's interesting to see how it works kind of in, in reverse in that sense. But I think China is still trying to sort out the region. They have not been involved uh, for very long in the Middle East. They don't understand the Middle East. They haven't had the experience nor the sources of information that are very reliable. So their involvement is very heavy on the energy side uh, and on the investment side uh, and very kind of shallow on the political side. And part of it is because they don't want to choose sides. Now, how can you deal in today's Middle East without choosing sides? You have to. You have to be a leader. You've got to stand up and, 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 and be for something, which always puts you against something. Uh, and they're just not willing to do that right now. That'll have to change as they move from an energy top-heavy presence in the Middle East, where primarily you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia is the three big kind of petro markets for, uh, for China. But on the come would be countries like uh, Qatar, uh, with, with the gas trade, which China wants to up substantially. So their profile is changing in the Middle East. Their trading relationships are, 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 are becoming um, uh, diverse. And I think their political involvement will have to change uh, with that. I don't see it happening soon, but I think it's inevitable. Yeah. And just on, on the Middle East, in April, China became the world's largest oil importer, and China, China receives more oil uh, from the Middle East than the United States, and a larger percentage of China's oil comes from the Middle East than comes to, uh, to the United States. And China is building this massive naval presence primarily to protect its oil route to the Middle East. And US, which is moving towards energy independence, 
is talking about a pivot to Asia, which will mean less involvement in the Middle East. So I think that all of these trends are pushing China towards having to play a, a greater role in that, uh, in that region. Yes. Governor, how do you think China perceives the Trans-Pacific Partnership? That's a great question. Uh, the, as, a, as a further step by the United States to box them in is their initial response, because they see everything we do in Asia as an attempt to kind of encircle them. Uh, and then on reflection, I think they're probably saying and debating within their sort of ministries and within the, within the party, uh, we ultimately would like to be part of TPP. I think they'd like to have some sort of incentive whereby step by step they could actually get to the point where they could be a full participant in TPP. And I think, truth be told, if we really wanted to manage economic affairs in the Asia Pacific region, we would be well served by having such an arrangement. Uh, it's not going to happen now because China's trade standards are just not up to where they ought to be. Uh, but we ought to be working on, for example, a bilateral investment treaty which would be a perfect thing for the U.S. and China to get done. I tried to get it done when I was serving in Beijing, only to hear that, well, Congress might not like it and we shouldn't do it. Well, you know, like in business, if you don't have stuff on the table that speak to leverage, your leverage in the game, you're not going to gain anything. You're not going anywhere. Uh, and uh, I would always be amazed at how little leverage we as a country were willing to put out there uh, uh, in order to get things done with, with China. So TPP is a perfect example. I'd say we've got the 12 countries that make up TPP, 40% of the, the global GDP. Uh, the negotiations are pretty much done. I think there may be currency manipulation is kind of an outstanding issue, primarily with Japan and the auto trade. Uh, but longer term, what is our vision? Where do we want to go over the next 20 to 40 year increment? And that's where I think China becomes a big part of it. If you don't, then you have two competing blocks. You've got RCEP and you've got TPP different standards, different approaches to harmonizing things. And as I found just in my last summer living in Asia, uh, you know, between Vietnam and uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, all of these folks are involved in RCEP, a different set of standards, and then you've got TPP, a, a new set of standards, it becomes very com confusing and, uh, and, and I think creates real economic conflicts of sorts if you don't have a longer term plan. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Governor Huntsman. Edie Simon Israel from Shanghai. Good to see you. Good Thank see you. Good to see you too. Thank you. It's an honor. Um, I have two observations I'd like your comments on sure. regarding education. Uh, first one, what I see uh, is an issue with the education system in China. As you mentioned, rote learning. It's really all by rote. Tremendous pressure for their students. After school studies, they don't play. They're not allowed out of the house because they have to do homework, and that's really all they do. Um, acceptance into college is a huge, huge problem all around China, tremendous pressures, um, increasing rate of suicide amongst students. Um, also, a lack of critical thinking mm. in their studies, uh, a lack of creativity and problem solving skills, um, which creates issues when they try to travel abroad and study. Uh, second comment um, that I'd like your insights on, there's a brain drain and a money drain out of China amongst the upper middle classes, people who are buying green cards, investing in foreign property in order to send their families uh, to the US, to Australia, to the UK, um, mostly for educational purposes. I'd love your observations on that. Well, on the first point, you're absolutely correct. And when I talk about their educational system is evolving, so they're evolving toward more in the way of higher ed opportunities. Let's call them community colleges, something less than four-year uh, options. I think they're going to they have a lot more of those uh, in the years to come. And the way that kids are taught, uh, less critical thinking, critical reasoning, Socratic uh, methods, uh, and that is changing too. It, it, is, it has been a stated desire on the part of education experts in China to move more and more toward. So they want to move more toward our model in that sense, where the classroom is a little livelier and you've got some real intertake with the teacher. And we should want to move more in their direction in, in terms of wanting to up our game just a little bit in terms of the overall commitment nationwide to education. I think we could probably meet each other at the 50 yard line. It wouldn't be a bad, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a bad thing. And, uh, and the second point on, um, I'm sorry. The brain drain. The brain drain. So, um, when has there not been a brain drain uh, out, out of China? So when I live in Singapore, which I've done many times, uh, you know, it's 75% Chinese, thanks to uh, 
uh, revolutions and upheavals going all the way back at least to the Opium War of, of 1842, the first Opium War. And then you had the second Opium War, then you had the Taiping Rebellion of the 1860s with 60, 70 million killed. Then you had the Boxer Rebellion and the invasion by Japan, the start of the party, World War II, 1949, Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen Square, and more recently, the reversion of Hong Kong. Each of those events have caused people to scatter. And so you look at the 1.3 billion in China, well, consider another five to 600 million as part of the broader Chinese diaspora throughout Asia Pacific. Why is that? Well, each chapter of, uh, of instability or upheaval has cost flight. And I think that uh, until China, again, this is where I think the messaging by Xi Jinping is gonna be really important in the years ahead. His whole goal has to be messaging around long-term stability. We've arrived, there's something to invest in, there's something to participate in long term, take your run mean be out from over the mattress and invest with us longer term. And that's really an uncertain message for most people, because when they hear it, they say, well, history would suggest otherwise. So in terms of capital flight, which you just look at the banking system in Hong Kong and where the dollars flow, and you get a pretty good sense of the overall level of uh, confidence in where China is going particularly with their latest downturn economically, uh, because there's, there's a huge question mark in terms of whether they can actually transition from the investment-led export model, which is well-established and successful, to the consumption model. They're somewhere in route. And as they're in route, you have people saying, I don't think I want to hang around forever on this one. I think I'll go somewhere else. And the, the, the plane is in midair. They're trying to remodel and redo pretty, the pretty plane much. while it's yeah, flying. Pretty much. And every time uh, growth slows a little bit, they get frightened because the legitimacy of the party requires consistent economic growth. So then they just keep pumping yeah. stimulus. It's really and, and I'll tell you, the issues before them are not inexpensive <laughs> issues. So let's just stop to think about Social Security. You know, start doing the actuarial analysis around that and you get to $20 trillion real fast. Uh, you know, start doing the analyses uh, on healthcare where you've got 700 million plus in the rural areas who don't have access to the kind of healthcare you have uh, in their wealthier coastal cities. Hugely uh, 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 consequential in terms of cost. The infrastructure build out. So it's, you know, it's cheaper uh, to export a ton of coal from the United States to China than it is to get it from Baodong uh, uh, to Shanghai uh, on the infrastructure, which is getting better, but it's still pretty pretty rickety. So just getting things around China uh, is tough based on their infrastructure problems, also carrying with it huge costs. Yeah. Um, Governor Huntsman, you've been a very good friend to AJC over the years. You've spoken at a number of our, of our events. I I'm going to ask you for some Policy advice. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm a failed politician. I'm not sure I'm any good at that. I don't think if you're you ask me, I'm going to turn to my rabbi, Benny Zippel. I don't, I don't think you're a curation for governor in Utah. I don't think you're a failed politician. You're just out of office right now. And we hope that changes. So, so here's, the, here's the policy question. You talk about the challenges in the East China Sea and the South China Sea and China. Um, premises its, its uh, expansionist interest on historical argument. We, we have rights to these islands going back a couple of hundred years, Qing Dynasty. Well, when AJC and Israel thinks about claims and territorial claims in the Middle East, the West Bank in particular, there is at least a similar trope of a historical claim to the land. How do we reconcile those two as an organization Obviously, we have great trepidations about what's happening in uh, the East China Sea and the <laughs> South China Sea. We see it very much the same way you do, that there's a, a threat to world stability or a reordering. Uh, at the same time, uh, as an organization, we have great concerns about the, the peace process, uh, the need for a two-state solution in the Middle East. How do we reconcile those conflicting approaches to historical claims? I think they'll play out uh, differently because the playing fields are so dramatically different. Uh, just, just having been in Israel, uh, it's, it's so immediate uh, and the security concerns are so prominent and they have to feature as being the central point in any negotiations going forward. 
with China, you've got en an endless expanse of blue water uh, without any sense of immediacy from a security standpoint. How things are adjudicated or how they're governed in the aftermath may be instructive. And that may be an area where uh, there could be some joint learning. So once uh, a template is arrived at with the South China Sea, how is it managed? How is it governed? Who participates? Uh, what are the dispute settlement features? So on and so forth. There may be something there that uh, will be of interest uh, or that would be instructive. But I have to tell you just uh, in summary, if I had the kind of working relationship that my friend Amos had in Beijing, uh, I would have been able to get a whole lot more done. Uh, China and Israel have a surprisingly close relationship. And as Amos used to tell me, uh, this is one of our most important relationships and the one that uh, is one of our better relationships. He numbered it in the top four, actually. Uh, and, and I watched with, uh, with interest uh, and amazement at Amos's professionalism. Uh, and the behind the scenes conversations he was able to have, very effective and at high levels. And I learned from him a great deal. Not only did I love him as a friend and a diplomat, but I learned from the way he operated. Uh, and uh, I always admired his ability and Israel's ability to get the relationship right. Despite differences, despite sensitivity, they, they, they took each other seriously at the table. And politics were generally put aside and the issues were front and center. So if there ever was a relationship that could maybe yield some interesting information on how to take similar, similar situations forward, there might be something here to look at. Sure, how much more time do we have? Okay. Two more guys. So what, I, what I'd like to do, uh, one, one second, um, is that uh, we have a little bit more time is to have everyone just have just a very short, maybe 30 seconds, two sentences to get, imagine what you want to say, condense it to a haiku version, uh, just so that I think just That'd be 575. Five, five, yeah, right? exactly, yeah, thank you. Uh, so just maybe we'll just go around and then at the end we'll allow the governor to have uh, some final uh, uh, final comments on everything. So starting it. I'll talk fast. Uh, might be out of your comfort zone. You talked about the uh, intellectual lack of intellectual freedom for <coughs> development in China. Could you compare this to India, where there is a lot of intellectual freedom? It's moved beyond. It's never been an export country like China. And what is the nature of the competitive uh, circumstance between China and India? Great. Yep. So yeah, and we're just going to go right around because everyone's going to be able to to say, but don't. If you haven't raised your hand, Sir, don't, don't just because the oh, things are happening. Really, just two sentences. Too. Yes. Then that's why you have the microphone. Uh, Governor, looking yes, beyond the East and South China Sea, do you see uh, a confrontation with the United States over the first island barrier, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, and the second, the Marianas and the Carolines? Great question. Please talk about anti Semitism and the rise of Islam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I represent Tibetans who are uh, helping them get visas in the United States to live here and also going to Tibet frequently. And they usually feel that their country is lost or their culture is lost. And the question is, do you anticipate that the United, and also the Obama administration did nothing for them. And so the question is, do you foresee that uh, America and the West will continue to ignore human rights abuses there and and elsewhere in China in view of the economic potential of China. Okay. Can we have time for two more of these of these quickies? So you and then you and then uh, and then everybody else can come up at the end. Yeah. The, the Chinese New World Bank versus the established US backed World Bank. Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, yeah. And then the last one here. Okay, this will be real quick. Uh, North Korea and China. Uh, trying to understand that, that uh, relationship and the value of it to China today, given China's engagement yeah. with the world and North Korea's lack of engagement with the world. Yeah. So you guys have thrown up a bunch of really easy <laughs> softballs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there, there, there's a, gr a great book uh, written by uh, Amaretta Sen called The Argumentative Indian uh, that really plays on the nature of debate uh, in part in, uh, in India. I've already given a copy to my nine-year-old Indian daughter, by, by the way. Uh, and I, I hearken back when you look at the differences uh, if, uh, between India and China, 
in terms of domestic discourse, intellectual fervor, give and take. So I was actually allowed on one occasion to speak at the Sanwei Bookstore in Beijing, uh, which was a no-no. That would have landed anyone in prison uh, not so long ago. And so China goes through these spurts where they'll open up and they'll close down. They'll open up, and I think they're still trying to find the right balance. So I did a town hall meeting at the Sanwei Bookstore. Come one, come all, come yell at the U.S. ambassador, bring your signs, tell, tell me what you don't like. And people showed up with signs and banners, you know, down with this, up with that. It was really a lot of fun. I thought everyone was going to get arrested. Uh, but that was, uh, and then it closed down for a while, and it kind of ebbs and flows. Now, in India, where I was just uh, uh, recently, I, I, went, I went to see uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who I got to know when he was the governor of Gujarat, and we adopted our daughter, Asya from uh, his hometown, uh, from his home state. Uh, and uh, so I went, I went to see the prime minister, a very interesting guy. Uh, and uh, uh, I walk in his office, the first thing he says was, how's Asha, my abandoned daughter? You know, I thought that's pretty cool. The prime minister asking about a total throwaway in society. And I said, Asha's great. She was heartbroken that her daddy wasn't elected president of the United States. <laughs> but she was very encouraged. <laughs> But she was very delighted that Narendra Modi was elected prime minister. <laughs> but it reminded me of uh, the debates that are so freewheeling in, in India. And I'll leave you with this thought between India and China, which has always been very tense, and it goes back to you know uh, a war in 1962 was sort of the more recent flashpoint. Modi's trying to hedge his bets a, a bit, and he's developing new relationships with Australia, with Taiwan, with Japan. It's really interesting to see how he's kind of breaking out. And he left this thought with me, which I thought was interesting. He said, I just met with all my diplomatic leaders, and I told them to start thinking about India differently. And that is, gone are the days when we're going to be seen as a balancing country. So by virtue of geography, Cold War politics, ideology, etc., etc., India's always been a balancing country. We're going from a balancing country to a leading country. And, uh, uh, and he had a strategy and he had a charge to his leaders to get them there. And I thought, this is interesting. This is the way that the world will now look, look at India going forward. Uh, on, uh, on the first island chain, uh, let, let me just say that this whole pivot to Asia thing, I don't quite get, because we've been in Asia forever. I mean, all the way back to the Spanish-American War, at least, you know, 1898. I've been back and forth, living in, in, in the region 35 years. We go, so when I heard about the pivot, I thought, well, what's new? You know, we've been in Asia for a long time. In fact, Asia is a great success story in terms of U.S. direct involvement, uh, keeping the sea lanes open for trade and commerce, promoting prosperity. There have been two wars since World War II, both of them civil wars in Vietnam and Korea, uh, where we've been able to find our strong allies in the region. Uh, and the first island chain, I would argue, is a perfect example of several balances, security balances, that we have uh, in the Asia Pacific region. The first is Korea, uh, against North Korea, uh, and it deals with a strong U.S. Army, U.S. Korean forces on the ground, and a strong Air Force. The whole theory being that the price would be way too high if ever you wanted to attack or grab land. That balance has worked. Uh, I would argue in Japan, based on a strong land force, uh, a strong naval presence, and the ability of the United States to deploy at a moment's notice, has really kept the East China Sea free. And that balance has been absolutely successful. And it's governed by a treaty, just as Korea is. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, I would argue that we have a similar kind of mini balance within the region. It's based on the Taiwan Relations Act, and it's based on a strong land capability by the Taiwanese, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and a missile capability for the most part. Not adequate enough, but it's there. Uh, the one area where I think we are deficient in terms of having established a security balance is in the South China Sea. And that's why for me, this is the real question mark. What do we do? Uh, what do we do in building a balance that is similar to what we have in Northeast Asia that has actually worked extremely well? So I think the first island chain is okay, and I think we're gonna be able to maintain that uh, sense of uh, stability. Uh, and it's why I also think that protecting the global commons for the United States has to be our, our prominent theme throughout, throughout the region. Um, Tibet, uh, having been there, it took me a year and a half to get permission to, to go to Tibet, uh, but there's a new film out, not that I'm promoting stuff like this, but I had to go to the Tribeca Film Festival with my good friend Jerry Cohen from NYU, who's a long, long time China hand and was a great mentor to me. Uh, 
And, uh, and the film was t uh, shot when I was ambassador to China, and it really is a behind-the-scenes account of uh, the U.S.-China relationship. It's called All Eyes and Ears. My daughter narrates it, uh, and it was picked as selected as a finalist at Tribeca, so we had to go up there and sit like this and talk to people about stuff in the movie business I'd ever talked about. But there's some, some sec sections there about Tibet that I think are really interesting if, if you have a, a chance to pick it up. Let me just conclude by this on Tibet. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is not going to live forever. And when he passes, I think we have a real problem. Because the way that the Tibetan people go about finding the new Dalai is a whole lot different than Beijing is going to want to do it. Like with the Panchen Lama, the number two leader in the Tibetan religion, they appointed the Panchen Lama, who's never been accepted by the Tibetan people for the most part. If this were to happen around the Dalai Lama, the next Dalai Lama, uh, I think you've got a major problem, a major problem with the uh, two or three million Tibetan people who are mostly in Lhasa. So that's just something to tuck away there. This could flare up in a way that would be very, very destabilizing uh, and, and ugly. Um, with respect to the human rights message, what I found serving in Beijing, we have values associated with who we are as Americans. You can try to hide them, you can try to diminish them or discount them or skirt them, but they are there, and they're for the world to see. And we're looked to and recognized for liberty, democracy, human rights, free markets. And when we try to diminish those as a people, we do ourselves a great disservice. Now I say this having been in some pretty rough discussions over the years, uh, where you try to hide a little bit here, where you try to over accentuate something there. And I've just learned through years and years of this stuff that we are who we are, whether Republican, Democrat, or independents. We have these values that are associated with the American experience. We all came in different boats, but we're in the same boat now. And why we don't recognize that we share these common values, particularly as it relates to foreign policy, is a mystery to me. So on the human rights front, keep that where it should be. Uh, on the AIIB, we fumbled that one big time. This is the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. We chose to try to build a coalition to stay outside of the infrastructure bank that China's trying to put together with dozens of other countries that they're funding to the tune of probably 40 to 50 billion dollars. And we lost. Nobody took our advice to stay outside. We found ourselves really as the only country on the outside. And instead of having the courage to say, I want to be part of shaping something that clearly is going to be an effort in redesigning development policy for the world. I want to be at the drafting table. I want to ha have influence in that process. We chose just the opposite, and I think it was a, a huge mistake. Uh, finally, uh, on North Korea, uh, you know, no one can figure out what's going on in North Korea. I think the Chinese are similarly befuddled. So if you want to see a Chinese official begin to uh, get really uneasy <laughs> in a meeting, Bring up North Korea. <laughs> it's, it's not like the last generation where, you know, we're partners in the party, we're partners in the great struggle of 50 to 53. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong's son was killed in 1952 and still buried in North Korea. Uh, today, it's, uh, it's a very unpleasant issue to bring up. And I think attitudes are changing in China very quickly about what to do about North Korea. So they're subsidized to the tune of billions of dollars in basic raw materials, and they're getting nothing in return. So North Korea blows off three nuclear weapons over the last many years. China doesn't get a heads up. They shoot short-range inter, uh, 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 intercontinental uh, uh, missiles in the Yellow Sea and, and beyond, and China doesn't get a heads up. They're constantly surprised at the uh, shenanigans, and I think they've had it about right up to here. So if ever there was a time where the United States and China should begin to work on getting on the same page with respect to a denuclearized Korean peninsula uh, and maybe a new system of governance over the longer term, it would be now. So as I said before, we could be here all day just talking with the one. But this man